are a wonderful fact to reflect upon. That every human creature is constituted to be that profound secret and mystery to every other. Time once again to sit back and relax with your favourite drink and listen. I hereby declare that I have been clearly informed about the nature and method of the study, as described above. I voluntarily agree to participate in this study. I retain the right to withdraw with this consent without having to give a reason. I realize that I can stop the study at any time. My personal data will not be viewed by third parties without my permission. Sign here. Ah, the same old blah blah as always. As a psychology student, I participated in dozens of these studies already. I even conducted two myself, one more boring than the other. Decades ago, some insane findings were found through psychological studies. Just think of the Stanford Prison Experiment or Milgram Study on Conformity. But nowadays, nothing remotely interesting is possible because of all the ethical regulations you have to follow. A woman, maybe 30, with short black hair and a lab coat, welcomed me at the entrance of the social studies lab and walked me to the waiting room. Hi, I'm Judy and thank you so much for participating in this study. Are you a student? She asked with a friendly smile on her face. I am, but I'm already in my third year, so I'm not participating for credit, I responded. Oh, I'm about to finish my degree. The only thing left is my thesis, and I'll finally be free. However, this means that I have hardly any time to work, so I could certainly use some extra cash. Watch a documentary at the lab. 50 euros or 5 credit points. Well, that's what the flyer had said. Oh, that's great. Then you probably already know how these things go. The process today will be as follows. You will watch a documentary for one and a half hours together with a different participant. After that, you will each be guided to your own cubicle, where you will do a few computer tasks and fill in a short survey. Your participant number today is 10. Please remember this number to ensure anonymity. Use these numbers with the other participant as well. Please don't exchange real names. Do you have any questions so far? Well, I had no idea I'd be watching a documentary with a different person, but figured that it was probably a part of the study. To see how people interact in a setting like this, or who knows what. They always have some hidden intention with these studies. Now, sounds easy enough, I said. After I signed the informed consent form, we walked to one of the rooms of the lab. Lab makes it sound somehow cool and fancy, but it's just a few boring rooms in the ugliest brick building on campus. The other participant was already sitting on the sofa inside one of the lab rooms, which reminded me of an old classroom without windows. Judy pointed me towards the sofa. I said hello and sat down next to him. For some reason he seemed really familiar, but I don't remember meeting him before. <laughs> Maybe he just reminded me of someone else, I figured. He looked like an average college student, young, brown hair, Guns N' Roses t-shirt. The only thing that stood out to me was his extremely pale skin, which reminded me a little of myself. I never get a tan due to some weird blood issue that I was born with. The movie will start automatically in a moment. Please pay attention as you will have to answer questions on it in the next part. Judy turned the light down and left the room, closing the door behind her. What do you think this is all about? The guy whispered. <laughs> Probably nothing. Maybe she's just observing us from next door, I joked. Oh, hey, that's my number, he said and pointed to my hand. Hmm, the number nine was written on my hand with a sharpie. This is weird. I don't remember writing anything on my hand. If anything, it should be a ten, I said, slightly confused. It was pretty early and I was tired, but... I would have remembered writing a number on my hand. <laughs> Maybe Judy secretly did that to screw with your head, he said and laughed. The documentary started playing and we stopped talking. Uh, I don't know if you've ever participated in anything like this, but it always feels extremely awkward. Adding a stranger makes it even worse. Or Maybe that's what they wanted. I watched the TV, but this <laughs> documentary wasn't making any sense. It was just a number of frames of unrecognizable forms and colors, as if someone had run Teletubbies through a blender 
and it was combined with the weirdest music I'd ever heard. Was this thing broken? I wanted to say something, but the number nine guy was looking at it really focused. Whoa, what the fuck? Nine suddenly broke the silence. Did you see that? I could tell he was breathing more heavily. What do you mean? I was still whispering. That looked really fucked up. Didn't you see that frame? God, was that real? Okay, never mind. Sorry, I think it just surprised me. Well, I tried to focus some more. Make some sense of this video that was definitely no documentary. And that's when I noticed it. For a tiny second, there was a word shown. Oh shit, I blinked too soon. A subliminal message, or a prime. I kept my eyes open and stared at the screen. Another word. Cerebrum. Followed by more happy colours and then mores. Now, cerebrum had something to do with the brain, but what's mores? There again. Oh, fuck. Did you not see that? Those words, I asked. Words? No. The, the pictures? I mean, did... That's when the TV suddenly shut off and the door opened. Judy was standing in the doorframe, smiling. This was the first part. Would you follow me to the cubicles now? With a weird feeling, I got up and followed her. The three of us were standing in front of the doors of the open cubicle rooms. You will be in room one. She looked at me. And you in number two. The program is already running. Instructions are included in there. I went inside the tiny windowless room, filled with fluorescent light, and sat down behind the computer. The door behind me shut. Hmm, okay, this experiment feels a little weird, I thought. But I only had to finish these few tasks and then I could leave. Well, I imagined I'd have to answer questions on that unsettling film. But instead, I was instructed to do some implicit association tests. You will now be presented with sets of either words or pictures. If you associate the concept with something positive, press the left arrow key. If you associate the concept with something negative, press the right arrow key. Well, it started off pretty normally. Photos of flowers, storms, and clothes. But then, it got weird. A smiling face, left. A bloody knife, right. A shattered building, right. Free will. Right off. <laughs> Left. God. Left. Sacrifice. Left. Murder. Left. Shit, this was going fast. Someone wearing a Venetian mask with bloodstains. Right. The same person stabbing someone. <laughs> right. Again, the same person looking straight into the camera. Right, right, right. God, what was this? The masked person holding the knife to his own throat. Fuck. I press left. I was starting to sweat. I mean, this didn't feel normal. It changed back to text. You enjoyed that? I didn't press anything. This was not normal. Don't look away. I wasn't pressing anything anymore. More unsettling photos started to appear. A little girl biting into something that looked like an organ. A heart? Dozens of organs piled up. The girl, now wearing the mask and laughing. And from that point on, it only got worse. I saw things that I will never forget. Pictures so disturbing I can't even describe them. Words I didn't recognize, but... Something inside me knew they were... wrong. I felt like I was about to throw up. I got up, my legs shaking. I'd had enough. This study was sick. I stumbled back to the door and tried to open it, but it was locked. Suddenly, the computer made a loud, shrill noise. The screen changed to another photo. It was me, wearing that mask and smiling. And then a photo of the other participant, number nine. 
looking into the camera with blood all over his face. Another photo of me holding a knife to my throat. What was going on here? I slowly walked towards the screen. I was feeling dizzy. Thank you for finishing part one. We'll see you again when you wake up for part two. Yes, I realize that I can stop the study at any time. <laughs> I had a hunch this wasn't true when I stood behind the locked door of the cubicle. I knew it wasn't true when I woke up in a strange hospital bed. Oh, you're awake. Oh my god. I've been waiting to talk to you for so long. You're like a celebrity. I slowly came to my senses. In front of me I saw a girl sitting on my bed, with a big smile on her face, but... This smile didn't feel warm. It was the same weird smile that Judy had, like the Cheshire Cat. She was wearing a clean purple shirt and purple pants, which looked somehow familiar. And then I remembered, that's what I was wearing in the photo where I held a knife to my throat. I looked down and noticed that I was wearing the same clothes, but mine were white. White as everything else in this room. Clean. Sterile except for the blood crust on my inner elbow. There was a syringe stuck to my arm, bandage wrapped around it. I started panicking. I pushed the covers away and tried to get up, but I felt too weak. Where, where am I? I mumbled. Well, you're in the psycho lab, silly. <laughs> Welcome back. Her blonde hair looked thin, her face pale, but her smile only got bigger. She must have been in her mid-twenties, but the way she talked made her sound like a teenager. Ten? That is so impressive. There's only one other person that got so close and... Ten? I interrupted her. That's the participant number they gave me. Did they talk to you about this? Did they do the same experiment to you? My heartbeat was racing. It's on your arm. It looks permanent. I guess this is your final one. <laughs> Congrats. She was right. On the spot that had said nine yesterday, there was now a ten. But this one looked like a tattoo. Permanent. Had that happened yesterday? Oh, I felt extremely confused. My head was heavy. I felt like throwing up. And I was at the end of the study. I did the task and... Well, that's the last thing I remembered. They must have drugged me and brought me here. Well, there are some studies that they conduct in the hospital where they test new medications or do sleep experiments, but this isn't possible. I did not give consent to be drugged and brought to a creepy hospital. There's no way the university would allow this. This wouldn't get past any ethical committee. And these people, they had something awful in mind. I had to get out of here. A thought hit me. Nine. Maybe they brought him here as well. What does the number mean? I asked carefully. I didn't feel like I could trust her. She seemed too okay with the situation, but I had to find out as much as I could. Jeez, did she forget everything? Well, that's your trials. I have two, look. She held her arm in my face, which had the number two tattooed on it. Most people are twos or even ones. Some threes. I'm actually happy I'm a two. It means I'll get my treatment soon. And after that, she jumped up and walked back to her own bed. Ten trials. Had I been here before? You said there's one other person that got close. Yes, it's ten nine. Now, look, can you please stop asking stuff now? The creepy smile finally disappeared from her face. Instead, she looked dead serious. They're in a different wing. They can't have high numbers talk to each other. Now, shh. And after that, she turned her face away from me and lay down in her own bed. So, the number on my arm had something to do with trials. Was this the tenth time I'd been here? I collected all my strength and got up. Number two seemed to have fallen asleep carried my body over to the window and looked outside. Everything looked awfully normal. The sun was shining bright. There was a big green lawn with a small pond in the middle. On the other side, there were big houses that looked like family homes. 
The whole street looked like a regular part of town, though I didn't recognize this district. Maybe they brought me to a different city. I started shaking more. God, why was I feeling so weak? I looked over to the houses, and the eyes of a person met mine. It was an older woman standing in one of the windows. I waved, cried, hit the window, but she showed no reaction. Finally, she smiled, that Cheshire cat smile, and waved back in the most calm way possible. I broke down in tears. I felt like I was sent to a different universe where everyone was bizarrely happy. I had to get out of here. I couldn't wait for part two of this experiment, or for some treatments, especially not after those photos. So I made my way to the door. Oh, please, 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 don't be locked, I muttered to myself. It opened. A feeling of relief rushed through my entire body. Well, that changed quickly when I heard two shouting, Help! Come back! Followed by a hysterical laugh. Fuck. An alarm went off. Red light filled up the surroundings, but I couldn't stop now. I was standing in a hallway with more closed doors. Probably more hospital rooms. From the end of the hallway, I heard some commotion. Someone was on their way. Afraid to run into them, I opened the next best door. I found myself in another room that looked just like mine. I closed the door behind me and held my breath. She ran out! She has to come back! I heard Two's muffled voice behind the door. What do you mean she walked out? Increase her dosage and then... The rest I couldn't understand, but, but I knew who it had come from. Judy. And then, silence. They'd moved on. I walked over to the hospital bed in the middle of the room. There was only one person in here. Well, that's if you could still call it a person. This man looked completely drained out, as if there were only skin and bones left of him. He was wearing the same purple pants, but his exposed chest was full of cuts. Some stitched up, some with bloody crusts. On his arm there was the same two tattooed, and next to it, this sign. Oh, but the most frightening part was his face. He was wearing the Venetian mask. Tears of desperation filled my eyes. I was certain he was dead, until his chest suddenly moved up, his ribs sticking out even more. He was breathing. I jumped back when, all of a sudden, his eyes opened and his mouth formed a smile. That same sick smile. Follow us. And with that, his eyes closed again. And I couldn't shake off the feeling that I had something to do with this. I'm sure it was him I'd seen on the photos. And I had pressed left. I had to get out, get help. I stumbled back to the door. There was no noise coming from outside, so I carefully opened the door and walked out. Oh, there you are. Hope you're ready for part two now. Judy. She was standing right in front of me, looking joyful as always. There was no way for me to escape, I realized, when two male nurses moved towards me. I thought about fighting them, finding a way to trick them, but I realized there was no hope. But I was too weak and there were three of them, so I followed them. Followed them down the hallway silently crossing more rooms which I could only imagine were containing more participants. I numbly followed. Followed them through this gigantic, sterile hospital until we walked into a room that felt completely out of place. It was beautiful. An old-fashioned movie theatre with red satin chairs and a screen as big as a wall at the end. The whole theatre was empty, except for one person sitting in the front row. The men led me towards him. From the back, I couldn't recognize anything. But then, I saw his face. Bloody. Beaten up. In his arm, the same syringe. Number nine. Our eyes met, but his looked empty. Absent, as if something had drained the life out of him. I tried to speak, but didn't know where to start. Then I saw Judy standing right in front of us, 
Behind her, the big screen. What did you do to him? I shouted. Now, now, let's all stay calm here, all right? He did this to himself. We never hurt our participants, especially not the most valuable ones. And now, quiet. I'm about to start with my speech. I could swear her smile disappeared for a second, but there it was again. Welcome to the psych lab, she continued in a cheerful voice. Or should I say, welcome back. She turned to me and winked. It was quite the trip, wasn't it? Oh well, you don't remember. <laughs> her laugh echoed throughout the whole room. Let me just say that you've been the most toughest of nuts to crack so far, but we would not expect any less from you. Our two alphas. Most of our participants are, well, let's say more simple-minded. One or two trials and they give themselves over entirely. But this is about you, and I can't wait for us to start the next part. The next chapter. Are you ready for the show? Stop. Stop. I want out. Please, let me go. I whined. Ah, oh. Judy sighed. For the first time, she looked irritated, almost angry. Really? You made it so far, past so many rounds. And now, of course you are always free to go, but think of all the progress you've made. Progress? What are you talking about? I stood up from my chair. I don't ever remember coming here. Well, you did. You came here nine times. And nine times you decided to stop and leave at some point. But you always came back, and you will again. We have your blood, after all. You saw the photos. We control you. Own you. Of course, you could just save yourself the trouble and... I want to go, I shouted and looked over to number nine. Come with me. We need to find you a doctor. I tried reaching for his arm. His eyes met mine once more, his gaze even more hopeless now. He looked at Judy and shook his head. I want to see the show, he whispered. Don't worry, love. We have enough doctors here. We'll take good care of him. Now off you go. Next time you can skip part one. Just come straight back here. We'll keep your bed warm. I hereby declare that I have been fully informed about the nature and method of the study, as described above. I couldn't believe they just let me leave. No fighting, no discussion. They just opened the door and I walked out. Of course, I knew it couldn't be this easy. There was a brief moment where I wondered if I'd imagined all of this, but as I stepped out of the door of the hospital and breathed in the fresh air, I knew this was real. I could feel it. I walked out carefully, too scared to make sudden movements, wondering if this was still a part of the experiment. I felt like a rat in a cage thinking it's free while scientists are looking down on it, measuring every little decision. No matter how much I thought about it, I couldn't comprehend. Why would they let me go? Why had they let me leave nine times before? Why did they not wipe out my memory? Well, I had to get answers, figure out the purpose of this study. But first, I needed to get help. It was already getting dark when I left the building. I tried to find some sort of orientation, but I was so tired and weak. I had no idea when I'd last eaten or drank anything. My best choice was to walk to one of the homes. Hope somebody will let me use their phone and not think I was some kind of lunatic. All houses were lit up, so I walked towards the closest one and looked through the window. The family was sitting around a table inside, about to have dinner. I rang their bell impatiently. Once. Twice. Three times. Nothing. Well, I could clearly see them inside. I could even hear the bell, but they showed no reaction. Feeling a little creeped out, I made my way to the next house, where exactly the same thing happened. At the third house as well. That's when I realised I had to get further away. I don't know if they put something in the water, or what happened here, but, but everyone seemed to be a mindless zombie. They had photos of me, where I did things I could never imagine doing. And they had more control than I want to admit. 
I had to get far away. And so I ran. The anger seemed to give me strength I didn't realise I had. I kept running until I saw another light in the distance. It was a cafe. When I got closer, I noticed there were a few people sitting inside, chatting and drinking while the server took orders. It seemed normal. Not normal like the maniacs in the homes, but genuinely normal. I stopped myself from running inside. First, I had to calm down and think. They seemed normal, but I didn't. I was dressed in white hospital clothes, had a syringe stuck to my arm, I was about to burst in and talk about some organ-stealing cultist hospital. I needed to come up with a somewhat believable story. Otherwise, I would just end up being sent to the nearest hospital, and that was the last thing I wanted. I removed the syringe, took a deep breath, and walked in. Ma'am, is everything all right? The gentleman at the counter asked, with a worried tone in his voice. Hello. I hate to be bothering you like this, but... I was just walking home from my work at the hospital when I was robbed. They took my bag and even my shoes. Could you maybe call the police for me? Well, I knew this sounded weird, but it was all I could come up with. Oh, God, that sounds awful. Of course, it's no trouble at all. Have a seat. You look exhausted. Going to get you a glass of water? He said. And for the first time today, I felt like I saw a person with a real smile. That would be really nice. Thank you. So I waited for the police, starting to feel more relieved, until I turned around and looked at the other guests and their smiles. They were all staring at me. One of the guests stood up and walked over to me. Tanner, why are you here? Are you dumb? (laughs) Go back. You deserve it. Go back, the other guests shouted in unison. The friendly man behind the counter was nowhere to be found. Where did he go? I slowly stood up. I had to get out of here. That's when I saw the police car parked out front. I ran outside, towards the officer. After talking to me for a little while, he offered to give me a ride to the police station, where I could make an official statement. I decided that this was the best option for me now. Once there, I could call someone I trusted. You know what? You don't look like you've been robbed, he said as he started driving. What do you mean? I was worried he might think I broke out of a mental institution. Well, I don't see any cuts. That's when I noticed the number on his arm. Three. Welcome back. Police again, I guess. I prefer the times you called your friends. Oh, the look of desperation and betrayal when you realised you couldn't trust anyone. Judy was already standing in the front of the hospital door, waiting for me. No words, she continued. Okay, well, you can stay outside or come back in and we'll have a little chat. There is no escape. No way out. Not until I know what is going on here. We were back in the theatre. This time, just the two of us. Did I come back to this hospital every time? I asked. Yes, but we sent you home afterwards, to start over. What, with part one of the experiment? Yes, we wanted to change variables. See what happens. The first time you were alone. You watched the documentary and felt so sick that we had to send you home immediately. Of course, you forgot everything about it and signed up again. After you see it once... There is no going back. She wasn't even smiling anymore. What exactly is the documentary about? Anything you want it to be. Have you ever heard of subliminal messages? Yeah, messages you don't consciously notice. Well, they're supposed to have an effect on you, but it's all bullshit. I mean, like the drink Coca-Cola, eat popcorn experiment. She laughed. (laughs) Almost. Yes, those studies were bullshit. You don't buy more popcorn just because of a secret message embedded into the film. Subliminal primes lead humans to certain actions, however, when the message is goal-directed. Imagine you are extremely thirsty, and you see the Coca-Cola message. You won't consciously notice it, but if you get a choice between drinks, you will automatically pick the Coke. 
It's just supposed to be a freaking school lesson now. She laughed out again. <laughs> this is why you're my favorite. <gasps> so cynical. You don't get the point, though. The messages work when they're in line with your urges, your needs. We planted ideas in their head with the documentary. Ideas that were matched with their deepest wishes. Then we showed them how to fulfill them. I was getting angrier by the second. So, you're telling me that the people here want to kill themselves and give you their organs? No, oh, they don't want to give away their organs. Don't be silly. They want to give away their minds. Those people, they don't want to make choices anymore. They're used to floating through life, always on autopilot. All they use is System 1, the first system in your brain. They don't need arguments or logic. Just a push in the right direction. Our messages work like wonders on them. They're ready to give themselves over. So what if some give us complete control of their bodies? It's still their choice. You fucking bitch. It's not a choice. Or where's the difference in falling for some advertisement on TV? The choices are there. All we do is give them some guidance. How can you compare murdering people with falling for some shitty ads? We're not murdering anyone. As I told you before, everyone is free to leave whenever they want. But they're happy here. And the mask? The knife? That was your idea, and I loved it. When you came here on Trial 5, well, not explicitly, but that's what we found when we looked for your deepest wishes. You're a psychologist. Try to analyze it. Fuck you. Now, oh, now... Not this hostility again. See, we perfectly match everything to our individual participants. Some work better with visuals. Some work better with symbols. Everyone is different. As I said, some give themselves over entirely. They just want to stop thinking. Well, these are our omegas. Others want some kind of purpose. So we give them work to do. As with our lovely police officers, all the friendly staff at the university... We call them our betas. And then there's the most elite group. The alphas. They like to take control. And with that, she pointed towards the door. Nine walked in. I don't know how they did it, but you look completely okay again. Healthy. Happy, even. I looked over while I heard Judy continuing her little speech. The messages are only the first step. We can show you everything else if you decide to stay. There's only a very small group that won't give their mind over. Do you know how long it took me to get the two of you? Oh, I need you. Together we can change everything. I know you don't completely understand yet, but we're making this world better. This is sick. Why would all these people just comply? I mean, I... Finally, Nine spoke. There is no option out. All you can do at this point is to enjoy the show. <laughs> at least we get the better view. I voluntarily agree to participate in this study. That was it, and she knew it. The number was tattooed on my arm. My last trial was over, and I was a part of the psych lab now. Now it was time to take the control that I deserved. I was an alpha, after all. But first, I had to get through this show. You know, it's not that difficult to deceive people. You just need to understand them, get inside their heads, and you can nudge them towards changing into anything you like. If you make them feel like they're part of an elite group, they'll start depending on it. If there is an authority, they'll follow without asking questions. Next, you give them a role, a purpose, and you make this a part of their identity. What if you had something to distinguish them from others, like put numbers on their arms? Have you ever taken part in an initiation ceremony, like hazing for a fraternity? You wouldn't go through the humiliation if you didn't really want it deep down, right? After breaking your will, they will get your eternal loyalty. They make you do horrible things, but... Tell you to remember that they're always voluntarily. It's an illusion. The choice is an illusion. 
They tell you there's nothing wrong with your blood being taken from you. Oh, try this medicine. It'll make you feel amazing. We'll give you some of this every time you help. Doesn't it feel nice to help? But it's not helping you. Only them. Of course, not every person will fall for persuasion or deception. We're at our most vulnerable when we start spacing out. You sometimes go to the kitchen and forget why. Say, <laughs> but then you realize you actually heard what the other person said. Or sit in your car and reach your destination even though you weren't focused on driving at all. If you make sure you're conscious, make your own decision, then you can shield yourself from the manipulation. Do you remember why you came here? Why you're doing this? Why you're looking at this? When was the last time you made your decision? You are different. You're not numb yet. Be conscious. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. You don't want to be here. You never wanted to. You are intelligent. You understand how this works. You can break out. Well, I tried as much as I could to talk over the music coming from the speakers of the theatre to get into his head, but he wasn't even looking at me. His eyes were glued to the screen, hypnotized. This is probably the reason Judy had left the theatre. Whatever's happening on that screen, it changes people. Which is why I had to keep my eyes on Nine and under no circumstances look at the screen. The sound was drilling its way into my brain, even through the napkins that I stuck in my ears. Luckily, I come prepared. While the gentleman at the cafe was talking to the police and the guests were watching him, I quickly grabbed a knife from behind the counter. That's what happens when people don't think for themselves anymore. They get careless. And Judy was the most careless one with her arrogant attitude. Of course, this show had worked the last time, so I couldn't completely blame her. I had to be fast. So I got the knife out and held it to his throat. Ready to cut. The screen turned black. The movie was over. She screamed when she stepped into the theatre. Seeing Nine, one of her beautiful alphas, lying there on the ground in a puddle of his own blood, must have surprised even a cold-ass bitch like her. The first moment of shock quickly turned into euphoria. She stared at me while I was sitting peacefully on one of the chairs. The blood smeared on my white hospital gown, not showing any sign of remorse. Ten is higher than nine, right? He was weak. I am not. I won, I said, come. Leave us alone, she directed at the two nurses behind her. A hysterical laugh escaped from her mouth. I told you you were my favourite. He'll do great here. We will. She was hunching over his body, looking for an indication on how I was able to conduct this brutal murder. So distracted that she didn't notice the knife that was being stabbed into her gut. Again and again. As I said before, distraction can work wonders. You're right. She was an arrogant bitch. So what do we do now? Nine pushed Judy's lifeless body away from him and slowly got up. Oh, I'm a little dizzy after losing all this blood. You know how villains always give away their entire plan? They are so proud of what they come up with that they have to share it. As we know from basically every superhero movie, that's their biggest misstep. That's how they lose. Judy was so proud that I'd come back that I was defeated and would never leave this place. And so, she told me all about her vision. How she had run this entire operation on her own, slowly building up an army of sheep. She would brainwash them into thinking they were part of the glorious new life. Part of a new era. Except, none of them were using their own minds. They were her little puppets. The useful ones worked for her. The less useful ones were harvested. Oh, selling organs is quite the lucrative business, and slowly she'd taken over the entire town. But she needed to grow, branch out, and for that she needed help. 
so she came up with a plan to recruit a new puppet master. Two had made it far enough. Now it was up to them to decide who would be the number one. Except, I didn't want to be part of her team, and neither did Nine, or Josh, after he woke up from his hypnosis. There are different ways to convince someone with facts, but most people won't even listen. Something else you can do is to evoke a strong emotion in them, like fear. Then you take it away, and just like that, the action that your body was getting ready for isn't necessary anymore, creating a void. A moment in which the brain isn't active. The perfect moment to get to the subconscious and influence someone. He was certain he would die in that moment when I held the knife to his throat. When he didn't, all I did was step back and ask for his name. It seemed to snap him out of the trance. <laughs> At least we used the syringe and didn't cut you up. You should feel lucky, I answered. He was right, though. What was next? How are you planning on getting out? The hospital is filled with her followers, he said. Just look at our arms. We're the highest numbers now. They'll follow us. For now, all I know is that I won't use this place to take away the organs of innocent people. They deserve better. They may not understand what's best for them yet, but whatever it is, I'll do a better job than Judy. Sometimes you can't give people a choice. Not if you truly want to make the world better. But, well, that's something I'll need to test. If you'd like to help, I could certainly use some participants. So the, um, eagle-eared among you might recognize the numbers 9 and 10 from a story I did just over a week ago, The Social Experiment, and it would indeed seem that, given that the uh, same person wrote those stories, that these are connected. So if you missed that one, go back and listen to it, and if you listen to it but you couldn't quite make the connection, go back and listen again. Uh, this is, um, a prequel perhaps? A sequel? I'm not quite sure. You have to go back and listen and make up your own minds. So, that's it for me for one more evening. Um, so, I asked you on the uh, community tab, what's the worst thing that's ever happened to you in a medical facility? Um, I will share my story with you a little bit later, but uh, yep, interesting indeed, isn't it? Okay, nothing quite that bad happened to me, but I've got a pretty gruesome story to tell you. Anyway, that's for another evening. Until then, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay?